freak people out more than it's going to help them. Okay, so let's start. How many of you are comfortable using serological pipettes? Okay. How many are comfortable using micro pipettes? Different group, but about the same. Good. So yeah, so I feel like everyone needs a little refresher. Cool. If you have trouble uh, seeing what I'm doing, you're more than welcome to kind of come closer. I'm okay with that. Okay. So um, for the serological pipette, we're going to start with that. Uh, if you look in the bins that are on your stations, there'll be a little pump that you can use for the serological pipettes. It's green. Um, that's the one that you're going to be using today. Um, depending on the volume that you need to pick up, these pumps come in different colors that basically signify what they can be used for. Uh, green can be used for volumes up to 10 ml. The blue ones, um, we have blue, fuchsia, and green. If you looked at the lab tour video, it would have shown you where they were, but they are in the cabinet underneath the supply bench. The blue ones are used for smaller volumes, usually one to two ml, no more than that. And then larger one the volumes are taken using this like it's fuchsia pink, weird color, salmon. It's, if you can have a shocking salmon color, that's what it is. So that's uh, what's used for up to 25 ml. Uh, most of the time you'd be using these. They are sufficient for most of the volumes you're gonna be working with. So today we're gonna be using these. How many of you have used these? Cute little things. Cool. So looking at these, um, we don't use bulbs. We don't take in liquids in our mouth. We always use these. Um, or if you're in the research lab or in my prep room, we use electronic ones. It's a lot easier. I know. But <laughs> we don't give those. My research students break them all the time too. So I don't, you know, they're just, you know. So you get to use this. Now these ones, um, they have a little dial on the side. You can dial it up or down, right? When you move the dial down and it moves up, that's pretty much to pick up the liquid. To release the liquid, we can push it down. You can also push it down just by pushing it down. You wanna do it carefully if you're doing it that way and you wanna just get some of the volume so you can control how much you're putting, pulling down, right? Um, in that case, it's usually better to go with the dial and not just push it. Now, um, if we were to just like take one of these, right? So just good habit to always point these away from you so you don't stab each other or contaminate yourself or your belongings with whatever's on them. Um, and so that's something that we're gonna focus a lot on throughout the semester. To use them, you kind of push this in here, right? Now you could just put it into the liquid and start pipetting, that's fine. But what you will notice is that when you release that volume, you'll have a little bit of liquid left behind because some of it just gets stuck on the glass uh, from capillary action and doesn't quite pull down and pull out uh, completely. So I can show you that first before I tell you what you should do. So if I were to push it in and then use the dial to pick up the liquid, um, I'm just pulling up 3ml right now, one, two, three. So how am I gonna read it? How do I know it's 3ml? Yes, you read the bottom of the meniscus. It's basically a mini graduated cylinder. And you wanna make sure there is no bubble underneath. If there's bubble, that probably means that I tilted it as I was picking up the liquid and brought in air. So see how I, when I do this, I bring in air into it. So you always wanna keep these vertical when you're using them. You don't wanna move them this way and that way because that's gonna introduce error into your story, right? Into your calculations. So I'm just gonna fix that again. And now nothing should be dripping and there should be no air. But now if I go to release it and I just release it like that, um, you're gonna have some liquid in the bottom because it didn't have any kind of, you know, there's still a little bit of liquid in there and you see it kind of linked together in there. It didn't completely empty out. To empty it out, if this happens, you can just kind of go up and down a few times fairly quickly and it will kind of push it out. So 
wait for all the liquid to collect and then go up and down. And that helps to push it up. Another thing you can do is before you ever put the pipette on, just dial it up just a tiny little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. And what that does is that it introduces some air in there, um, kind of acting to push the rest of the liquid out, right? So it's gonna build a little bit of that uh, buffer zone so that once you have released all your liquid, there's still a little bit more to dial down and that's gonna push whatever left in there. So I'm gonna do it that way this time. And again, I take some volume, there should be no air bubble and it shouldn't drip. And then this time when I release, I see a lot less in there. Cool. Okay. So if you don't mind, go ahead and uh, take the pipettes that are on your bench and just try them out a little bit. Um, each person, you guys can uh, push it in and you can try using it with the water that's on your bench. You should have some water, you should have some methylene and blow. You should also have a beaker that's typically used for a waste beaker, liquid waste beaker on our benches. Uh, and we will use it as that, but for now you can put in some of your water pour in there if that's easier, or you can take water from the tube and pipette it in here as practice. Just a little bit to get a feel for these. Remember, you always want to keep it vertical. That's the biggest thing. Yes, it should be a tiny little bigger. That's what it is. What you looking for? Water. Oh, I didn't give you guys any. Okay. So what you guys can do is have a few. So keep the water on one side and get the maximum glue to the other, and then you can swap them out later when you need them. So same thing here, if you don't have water uh, or methylene blue, take it from the group in front of you. Yes. Sign in. Perfect. This one, the other one's perfect. Okay. Guess what, guys, I'm going to bring today. Okay. So, you know, when we are. Uh, doing serological pipetting, a lot of what we use them for is preparing solutions and make preparing dilutions of our samples, uh, which is why it's important to know how to do this correctly. So for the first exercise that we are doing, or that we did for the pipetting lab, you had six tubes, okay? And these six tubes for where we prepared a 50% serial dilution here. So does anyone know what a serial dilution is? Where you constantly dilute what? Already diluted sample. That's what's important here. So you start off with your super concentrated stock solution. Uh, in your case, that's that methylene blue, right? That's on the benches. So your methylene blue, for all intents and purposes, I know it says a very specific number on them, it is your 100% stock solution, right? So this is your 100% stock methylene blue. And we are gonna be preparing one half serial dilution, right? So to do that, if we have four ml of methylene blue in the first tube, how much water should I put in the second one to make a one half dilution? Should make that. So we're making one to two dilutions. So you're gonna put two ml of water in the first one and in all subsequent tubes that you're gonna be preparing. Okay. Now to create that first dilution, what should I do? So what you're gonna do is take two ml of the methylene blue from that first tube and you're gonna put it in the second, right? And so now when we mix it up, what do we get? What percentage? It will be 50%, exactly, because this 
one hand, one half, then we're going to flip to the first. Now, we're not going to go to our stop solution ever again in the remaining of the series. Whether we have six cubes, 10, or 100 doesn't matter. What we will do is we will now take two ml of the second and put it into this first. Right? And so when we do that, what will be our next number? 25%. Right? So in each time, in each dilution, it's going to be a half of the one before. Right? But it's going to be compared to this, it's going to be one fourth. Right? And then the next one's going to be one eighth. Right? So it's going to be serially diluted. Why is that important? Why? Where would this be important? Where would this be a good thing to do? Thinking specifically, you can think in clinical terms or in molecular and cellular biology terms. What's the good part about something like this? So, well, but I can make dilution separately where I just take one mil of this one time and three ml of water and half an ml of this and three and a half ml of water and make dilution that way. Because, not really, yes. Good. So one big reason, yes, you did. So that was a very good try. Um, but yes, one is exactly that, that you can get a super concentrated solution uh, that needs to be done only, let's say, one to 10,000 to be able to fit in the assay. Well, if I were to do it the traditional way, and I take one ml of that super concentrated stuff, I have to add 9,999 ml of diluent. That's a lot of waste to get rid of. Right, but if I do it this way, right, and I'll show you an example. So if we have our one, the super concentrated solution, and I diluted one ten, right, I would put one ml of the solution over here, and how much of diluent? Nine ml, just plus nine ml, and then I could do it again the same way. And I could have one ml of this diluted solution and put nine ml of the diluent. And what would be my uh, final dilution here? One to a hundred, right? So if I do this, I can just do four sets of dilutions, right? In a serial manner, and I can get one to 10,000 and only have 50 ml of waste instead of right 10,000 ml of this. That's a big difference. So that's the biggest um, the reason that you would do something like that. Actually, the second, the biggest reason is that let's say, again, you're like, well, I'm not going to make 10 liters of waste. Let me just take one microliter of this and dilute it down in you know, 10 ml to get my um, 1 to 10,000. Can I do that accurately, really? How accurate is that going to be when I'm trying to find that one microliter and then diluting it 10,000 full? So this allows a lot better uh, accuracy because I can pipette one ml accurately. I can pipette nine ml accurately, right? Or even 100 microliters, I can pipette accurately. So being able to do that allows you to maintain higher accuracy and be able to create a lot less waste, right? Um, another reason, especially in molecular and cellular biology, is that we are gonna be working with small quantities. We are working with cells. So many times we have our material, protein, DNA, that we extract is precious. We have very little and it has to go a long way. We have to be able to do a lot of things with it. So by doing it, um, in a serial dilution manner, I can use less material to get what where I need and not have undue waste. Cool. This is very important in microbiology too, for those who have taken it or um, are familiar with it. 
especially uh, imagine a, a, a patient coming in with UTI or fungal infection and you need to quantify, right? You need to culture their spores or culture the bacteria. You can't really take that urine or blood sample straight up. You many times have to do exactly the serial dilution so you can quantify, actually count the colonies that form at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so important. Now what I'm gonna do is show you what that would have looked like. So we're gonna have six tubes for this. We always wanna make sure that our tubes are labeled, right? So we know where sample, which sample is where. Because if we don't, I love to flip people's tubes around just to confuse them because they didn't label them. Same thing with lids. If you label lids instead of the plates, you always want to label the tubes. And even if I didn't do it, I promise you, you'll be confused at some point. So you don't want to do that. Now, for this, he thinks I'm crazy. That's okay. I'm good. Okay. So one thing I want you to look at. Pick up your pipettes and look at them a little bit. Everyone should have a pipette in their hand. If you look at these, you will notice that the tick marks, your gradations, right, that tell you how much you're picking up, they end at 4.5. So the tip, even though it's included in the measurement, is not graded. That means if I wanted to pick up 4.7, let's say, I couldn't do this accurately using this pipette. Right, I would have to kind of estimate how much those 0.2 ml would be. So that's just something to be mindful of when you're using this. Even though it's that tip is included, that last half ml is not graded. The other thing you want to observe is that on one side, the numbers are in bold, um, but they go in reverse order. So they go four, three, two, one. So this is a five ml pipette that we have in, your, in our hands but the numbers here are going in reverse. So if I wanna pick up four ML, how far am I gonna go? Where am I gonna go? I'm gonna go to the one, exactly. Now that's an easy number, so it's not a big deal, but if you had that 4.6 ML or a different number, it can become confusing to some. And if that's the case, you can always reverse it. The numbers are smaller and not bold, but they go in the correct order. So it is easy to just see where you are on your numbers. Um, so just be aware that that does exist in here. It's just not the most user-friendly way to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna take my 4ML. Make sure it's correct. I'm gonna get it out, right? And then, you are going to take your water. I'm using your other pipette. You would take your water. So, one thing that you always want to again be mindful of is if you're gonna, if you're done with something, put it away. Right, close the lid so it's less likely to spill. Okay. So to get your water. I can get two mLs or 2.3 mLs or whatever the volume is that I'm picking up each time, right? And do them separately. If I do that, I want to take it off and push it back in each in between to make sure there is no residual liquid left over. Yeah, you still have to come back from the other side though. The other way that I can do is that if there is enough space in my pipette, I can actually go up to twice as much, right? 4 ml or 4.6 ml. And I can put in 2 ml in one and then put in the remaining two in the next pipette, uh, in the next, uh, next test tube. Cool. So either way is fine just whatever you're comfortable doing. Some people think they can get more mistakes if they try to do multiple wells. If that's the case, you do single one at a time. And so I have two more. Okay. 
always want to make sure the meniscus has stopped moving before you take it out and push pull it to the next one. Because sometimes if you have today, it's water, no big deal. But if you have something viscous like DNA protein, a little bit thicker, like honey consistency, it's going to take a little bit for it to all fall out. So you want to make sure the meniscus has stopped going down before you uh, move to the next place. So now I'm done with this. I'll put it away. And then you go back to your blue pipette, whatever you use to take your blue, and you take, according to this, 2ml. So I'm going to take it, and I'm going to take pick up my uh, tube so you can see it better, and you're going to mix it in. Now, one easy way to mix it instead of just licking the tubes is to just pick up all the liquid once and push it back out, okay? By doing that, you mix it very well without disturbing the piece and slumber. It doesn't splash on you or do anything else on you. Um, so I'm done with that too. I'll quickly take this out. And then I'm gonna take two ML from this tube right and move it to the next and repeat that process that makes sense yeah so like i said you'll get plenty of pipetting practice today um, in a little bit if you feel like you want to practice a little bit right now making something uh you can again use the liquids that are provided to you to kind of play around with it for a few minutes and then we will go to the next slide. So once I'm done preparing the dilutions, how do I know that I've done it correctly? Just qualitatively, you know, not quantitatively, but qualitatively, how do I know? Yes, the color should be lighter and lighter and lighter as you become more and more and more dilute. And uh, anything else that we can look at to see if we, we are doing things correctly? Again, just qualitatively. That's right. All the menisci should line up except for the very last two because that's gonna have the full volume, right? Instead of the half. So that's what you would do is we're going to observe the menisci, make sure they're all lining up. And the last one's uh, going to be a little bit more and make sure that they are all getting more and more and more dilute as you right. I'm wearing blue. It's not showing, it's like blue against blue. There you go, now you can see there. Anyway, so um, now how can I check for this quantitatively that I did this correctly? Say it again. Uh, what's the purpose of a plate reader? What am I using it for? Absorbent. Absorbent. So essentially it's a spectrophotometer function, right? I could use these cuvettes in a spectrophotometer that takes individual cuvettes as well. But we are gonna be using a plate reader. Um, we're using the 96 well plate. So we take a small aliquot of the sample, right? We take 250 microliter, plate it, and then read it uh, using the spectrophotometric plate reader. Now, something to remember, any time that you're running any type of dilutions of a substance, you always need to have a background control. Something that doesn't contain whatever it is that you're preparing dilutions of, but does contain the diluents a lot. So in this case, what would be that, uh, you know, kind of uh, something to look at the background noise? Huh? 100% what? Well, that is going to actually have a lot more of that substance. So we want something that doesn't have any methylene, right? Water, exactly. So once again, if you're making a serial dilution of methylene blue or a red dye or a green dye, as your background control, we want something that has zero amount of that. And so that would be usually the diluent in this case, water. So you would have your water only, and that water only um, sample is going to serve as a background control. 
it should ideally give you zero absorbance. Whatever little absorbance it gives you, that's the background noise. And you would subtract it from all the other numbers so that you can uh, just remove that from the sample and then look at the sample, uh, the rest of the sample results. Now, in an ideal world, because we prepared 50% of one half dilution series, if the absorbance of 100% solution is one, what would we expect the second one to be? 0.5, good. It should be exactly half of the one before, right? And the third one, 0.25, right? And so you would expect each one to be half of the one before. You could plot it on a graph. What would be on the x-axis? Concentration, because that's your independent variable, right? That's what you're changing. The uh, x axis will always have your independent variable, so it's going to be the concentration of methylene blue in percentage. And then what's going to be on your y axis is going to be your dependent variable, which is going to be your absorbance um, that you receive after removing the background noise, the blank corrected absorbance. Now, in an ideal world, in this case, you should get a direct relationship between absorbance and concentration, right? And so you should be able to have a line go through it, a linear trend function go through it, and get a y equal mx plus v equation to an r square of one. The closer your r square is to one, the more precise your dilutions were. That just tells you how well you diluted your samples. It doesn't mean it's accurate. Right? Because imagine a situation where I accidentally, because I was quite cutting, I took, um, instead of my 4.6, I just took two ml of water, right? Or uh, for each of the dilutions, I used two ml of water, but then I used 2.3 ml of methylene blue for, in each dilution. I was very precise. I always did the 2.3 from the one before, but it's no longer, and it's gonna give me a linear function but it's not gonna be 50% and 25% and one eight, right? So when I prepare a test sample to look at accuracy, it's not gonna fall where it should because my graph, while it was precise, was not accurate. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So then we prepare a test sample to make sure, right? So the R square just tells you how precise your graph. That's looking at precision only. To look at the accuracy, you need to have a test sample where you know what you prepare and you see if it can give you that using that equation. If that equation, if we have the absorbance and the equation, it should give you the same percentage that you get. So for example, if I make a 25% solution, right, then I expect my absorbance to be exactly where the 25% solution absorbance is lining up, right? If after I check, the, uh, check it in the equation, if I put the absorbance for Y and solve for X, if it gives me 30 or 33, then I know it's not accurate. Ideally, if it's accurate, it will give me 25. It will be the same absorbance as my uh, 0.25, my Q3, right? Okay, so the test sample using the y equals mx plus c equation, when you get the x value, that's looking at accuracy of your standard curve. That's your accuracy. Everyone good with this? Cool.